everyone. My name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all today. We're going to be talking about something that is basically a hot topic if you are on certain parts of Twitter and I'm hoping it's going to be equal parts educational and entertaining to discuss this. So we're going to be going over a lot of stuff from asexuality to oppression, representation, social media, and people that get very, very mad at photos posted on twitter.com. And it is a little bit silly, frankly, but also I wanna cover this because there are not very many big ace YouTubers out there anymore at least, and I worry that if I don't make this, the entire conversation might end up being completely dominated by non-ace folks making reactions to and commentary about this, and I want there to be at least one different opinion available on YouTube if people are looking for it. So that's what we're doing today. And essentially, this whole situation revolves around Arrow Ace activist Yasmin Benoit, who we have talked about recently here on this channel, and she has been doing so much work for the Arrow and Ace communities and really been putting in the hours. She has been going to pride parades and doing interviews and has been doing that for a number of years now. And she was actually invited to be a grand marshal for NYC Pride, which is such a huge accomplishment. I think that's really great both for her personally, as well as for the Ace community as a whole. And she was also at a pride event called Pride in London at the very, very very end of June, I think possibly July 1st. And she took a very cute picture at the event. She posted it to her Twitter account and she had this caption attached to the photo. Asexual people deserve equal rights. We deserve legal recognition. We deserve protection. Thank you at Stonewall UK for allowing me to march with you again at hashtag Pride in London today and for helping me to bring about this change. Hashtag this is what asexual looks like and hashtag I stand with Stonewall wall. And you think, oh, that's a nice photo. It's like nicely composed. It's a cute outfit. People are definitely going to be normal about this, right? 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 <laughs> no, of course not. Of course not. Of course not. They could never be normal about this. <laughs> there was zero chance of that happening. Everyone seemingly freaked out over this photo, okay? We had just some of the worst denizens of the internet commentating about this and adding their just so desired opinion about this photo. We had Ollie London, we had Blair White, we had some guy named Dr. Roger McFillin who, from what I can tell, makes his living telling people that their ADHD isn't real and that antidepressant medication is evil. And I don't really know why he thought he needed to speak on this, but I guess he did because you gotta take the marketing opportunity, am I right? And frankly, I am shocked that people like Ben Shabibo or Matt Walsh have not yet made 20 minute videos about this photo because that's totally their style, but they haven't done it yet. And I'm wondering if it's because it's just like they're waiting for a slow news week. It's on the bulletin board. It hasn't quite come up yet because they love talking about stuff like this. And like I said, people were not being normal about this. They were coming after Yasmin personally and the outfit and asexual people as a whole and like the entire concept of pride and rights and like basically what rights don't asexual people have. That was like the big response to this. And it wasn't just people on the right either. It was so-called progressives like the apparently infamous Brianna Wu who had a very but I'm just asking questions approach to this whole scenario where as soon as Brianna was getting answers about her just asking questions questions, she would then start blocking people when she didn't like the answer and then go, well, sometimes I occasionally would get an answer from a mature adult in the room, but that was drowned out by all the really annoying bad people. And it's like, well, but I know some of the people that you were talking to. I saw the threads, Brianna. 
I was there, I witnessed it. And you were blocking people that were being very nice to you and were just educating you because you wanted to be by your own admission. And then when you didn't like the response, you lashed out. But you know what, don't worry about Brianna because she got every opportunity afterwards to cry about the Twitter mob run amok and just, I am pretty sure that Brianna learned nothing from the whole scenario and only got angrier and more defensive about 99% of her positions. I think she maybe moved on one thing, but that was basically it. So yes, this was something where everyone on all sides was coming after Yasmin. And you know, I don't really want to go in to the details of what happened to Yasmin and like the personal attacks that she got. But essentially, all of the responses to this photo could be summarized like this. You aren't oppressed. What rights don't you have? I mean, who cares about how much you're having sex or not? That's not really anyone's business to begin with. And you are taking away precious time and resources from real queer people that actually have a struggle to worry about. And I mean, really, this is just all for attention. But assuming that anything you're saying is actually happening, have you tried taking medication before? Oh, have you stopped taking that medication? Have you stopped taking antidepressants? Oh, you've never been on antidepressants? I mean, well, in that case, have you gone to a doctor before? Have you had your hormone levels tested? Have you gotten blood work done? Oh, have you talked to a therapist or maybe a priest perhaps? Yeah, it all got really ridiculous and these people would say all of that and then they would have that reflected at them and then they would go i mean why are you saying that what i'm doing right now is an example of the very oppression and the rejection you're talking about i'm just telling the truth and it's like people just really don't get it and it's very funny because Yasmin didn't mention anything in her post about oppression points or that Arrow or Ace people are the most oppressed out of anyone and they need the most help and to focus only on them. Like all she was saying was that Ace people and Arrow people deserve the same rights and the same protections as any other sexual minority. And She's right about that, but instead of listening to that point at all, people were going after her outfit and the way that she was dressing, and it was like people were looking at her and going, well, I mean, you're not dressed like how an ace person would. I mean, I've never met an ace person before, but I assume they would not be dressing like that. And it's, it's funny because how you dress has nothing to do with your experience of having sexual attraction or not has nothing to do with it. And people were going through Yasmin's past history and her modeling career because Yasmin is a model that is her job. And then they would go, oh my God, look at this photo right here. You're telling me an arrow ace person would dress like that. And it's like, modeling is a job. It's not a reflection of like your inner eroticism or something like sometimes it is but most of the time it's a paycheck and it's more telling on you that you have that reaction and you are reading into those photos that much like i might blow your mind here but did you know that at least in america where we have tipping for staff that do things like this did you know that people that work in a restaurant you know the wait staff when they're nice to you or a barista is nice to you, it's not because they personally like you or have a crush on you or want to date you. It's because if they're nice, you tip them more because that's their job. <laughs> it's wild, I know. Just because you have a job and you're nice or you look a certain way in a photo doesn't mean anything about your very personal internal experience. And yeah, ace people can wear whatever they want. Wearing a particular outfit or an accessory has no bearing on your experience of sexual attraction. Like that doesn't make any sense. You know, you could be nude 
and you'd still be asexual. And you know what, secretly, they may not know this, everyone under their clothing is already nude. I know, wild but also a fact. And if you're a man and you wear a skirt or a dress, and you're wearing it for a Halloween costume or for some kind of fancy dress party, does it mean that you're no longer straight if you're a man and you wear a dress if you were straight at the beginning of the process, okay? And I say that realizing that some people who commented on this photo originally would also say that wearing a dress as a man means that you're gay, but then how do we explain Steven Crowder then? <laughs> Sorry, probably shouldn't be getting that political in this, but you know, we're already there. So what I'm trying to say is that you can be ace and dress however you want. And just because you're wearing a certain thing doesn't have anything to do with your orientation. And to assume otherwise is ridiculous. And you can't really tell how a person internally feels from a single photo at a very particular event where that kind of dress is standard for most people going to that event to begin with. And you know, I'm an ace person, right? I'm asexual, I'm gray A. And this is basically how I dress when I'm on camera or oftentimes when I'm out in public. You know, I wear long skirts and sweatpants and t-shirts and like baggier fitting items. And part of the reason why I do that is not because of my orientation. It's because I don't want unwanted attention from strangers. I don't want someone to come up to me or leave a comment on a video where they are coming at me in a way that I don't want. And it's not because of the way that I'm dressing is like inherently sexual or not, it has nothing to do with that, but people's perception of how you dress affects how they treat you. And so that means you could be wearing something, not feeling any particular type of way about it, and then some stranger comes along and then makes a comment or touches you or tries to make some kind of advance on you. And like, I don't wanna deal with that. And I know, of course, that regardless of how I dress, people are still going to perceive me in a certain way. They are potentially going to interact with me or touch me in a way that I don't want. And no matter how I dress, I cannot 100% avoid that. But I have noticed a correlation in how I dress dress generally and the way that I am treated and perceived and I choose to dress in a way that will not invite as much as possible unwanted attention from strangers out and about. And I actually think it's really great that Yasmin can go out and be somewhere like Pride and dress this way and be so bold and true to who she is because I know that's really hard to do. I know that basically the only place I feel like I can dress how I actually want to dress is like when I'm either in private at like a house party with friends or I am at a very well-known location that is public but is for a more private group. And it's just so, I think, galling that in our society, we have to tailor how we dress, not because of how we personally want to express ourselves in an artistic way or an aesthetic way, but because of we're trying to like navigate, like at least for me, you know, this is how I want to be treated or talked about or perceived. And so in order to avoid the worst part of it, I'm like curtailing how I present myself in order to avoid things that I don't want. And maybe that is just me and projection, but you know, that's my own experience. And actually this discussion about what Yasmin was wearing is how I got looped into all of this because I got a little bit into it on Twitter, I will admit, because there is a guy, many, many guys actually, of the type of profile you can imagine that were commenting on this and there was one person in particular that I responded to and their tweet has since been deleted but essentially what they were saying is oh my god that is a sub collar she is wearing a sub collar out in public how could she be possibly asexual or aromantic in any way I don't get it and it's like that's not how how any of this works my guy like first of all not a sub collar in that photo that is a harness that's a harness and last time i checked you know a harness 
not currently in the modern age, an implicitly sexual object. It is a fashion item, definitely by this point in time. And you know what? Part of his reaction as well, if I can remember it correctly, was essentially saying, this has to be sexual. And you know, I don't know Yasmin. I don't know if this is like a kink or BDSM thing for her or just a fashion thing, which is also totally possible. But even BDSM itself isn't inherently sexual. If you're wearing a collar or a harness or a hood or anything like that, not inherently sexual in any way. It can be for some people, but you can't by default assume that it's just a sex thing, you know? Like that's, we're, we're beyond that point in time. It's something you can wear just for fashion or for fun or for having it be part of your relationship or part of how you express intimacy, but not in a sexual way. And what was truly wild and unexpected about this is somehow my opinion about this led to me being quote retweeted by Graham Linehan, who if you don't know who that is, bless you because you're so lucky. But if you don't know who he is, he is essentially the second biggest turf on Turf Island. He's right up there with JK Rowling, but if JK Rowling was also a late middle-aged divorce man who was like the ultimate victim of divorce court on top of being a transphobe, you know? Like that's really his whole vibe. And I was worried because he has over 500,000 followers on Twitter. And I thought, oh, this is, this is gonna go real. This is gonna go real bad for me. But he tweets so much that only like 20 people <laughs> liked his retweet of me. And almost all of them were transvestigators that were not only sure that I was an ace and that I wasn't a woman, they thought that I was a man that was an angry incel and oh, how wrong they are, but you know, that's a story for another time. So essentially what all this led to is about, and I kid you not, five straight days of everyone on Twitter seemingly having an opinion about this. It went trending multiple times. It was all over the place. It was really, really big news. And the capstone to all of this was that Yasmin, who is an activist and regularly goes out for interviews and does talk shows, she actually did an interview with Newsmax. And Newsmax is very well known as a right to far right publication. And this made me very worried because with that kind of exposure, there can be a lot of negativity that comes along with that. So what I wanted to do is I wanna share some solidarity with Yasmin here. I want to be with her in this in some small way and watch her interview and go over maybe some points I think are worth pointing out and just break it all down a little bit more as just, you know, sort of an end note to this whole conversation. So I guess let's go ahead and do that. Now, what does that mean, honestly? I, I, I don't know, I don't have any idea. Merriam-Webster defines asexual as people who, quote, not having sexual feelings towards others, not experiencing sexual desire or attraction. Now, apparently this is an entire class of people that believing they're being underrepresented right now. So I will say to start off here, I'm not a huge fan of using dictionary definitions for groups of people or communities or things like that because oftentimes dictionaries will lag behind the self-definitions that are used by members of those communities or of those groups. And dictionaries are meant to be a reflection of what those self-identification parameters are, but they're not always perfect. And I think here's a really good example of that because I don't think this definition is totally wrong. I would, however, take issue with the inclusion of doesn't experience sexual desire because what does desire mean exactly? That is a very vague term. And I think a lot of people would look at that and go, okay, desire. So that means ace people never get wet. They never get hard. They never look at porn. They never masturbate. They never read erotica. They never do any of these other things. And they have no desire at all for anything. They have no urges, no inclinations for anything ever. And if somebody does, that means they're not ace. They're like a gray blob with no feelings ever at all in any capacity. I think that's how a lot of people end up seeing it. And that's 
not very accurate. I think one really clear example of how this can be faulty is, let's say, for example, there's an ace person that has a penis and they have some biological needs on a regular basis. Does that mean they're not really ace because occasionally they have to have an emission of a certain bodily fluid on a regular basis? I don't think it would be accurate to classify that as a desire as opposed to a biological urge or a need of some kind, but a lot of people would see it that way because of how we talk about sex in this country, in this culture, and I think it just is kind of unnecessary to include all of that. I think Yasmin is probably gonna give a way better definition. I think that one is worth working off of. One person in particular has been advocating for their rights and received a storm of hate comments after making this tweet saying, quote, asexual people deserve equal rights. We deserve legal recognition. We deserve protection. Now, anyone who knows me knows that I'm open to any and all conversations on literally any topic. So joining me now is that same woman, the tweet Yasmin Benoit, asexual advocate, model and writer. Um, Yasmin, I pre appreciate you joining us. Uh, so I, I, I let me just come out, what is an asexual? Being asexual means experiencing little to no sexual attraction towards anyone, regardless of their gender. Okay. Um, so, in, and that obviously falls into this, this new umbrella of the LGBT movement and things like that. So you would express that they're being underrepresented and maybe don't have the same, you know, treatments as some of the people in the rest of the community. What are some of those specifically that you're talking about? Well, in the UK, we aren't included in the UK Equality Act 2010. We aren't recognized as a sexual orientation, which of course has a knock-on effect to other areas where people would usually be protected by the Equality Act. We're also still a pathologized orientation in the International Classification of Diseases over here, which is also um, used throughout Europe. Um, we were also pathologized in the DSM that you use over there in the U.S. And consequently, um, the National LGBT Survey 2018 found that we're 10 percent more likely to be offered or to undergo conversion therapy compared to other orientations. And yet our government over here does not want to include us in the ban on conversion therapy. So that's what I was talking about. So so the 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 act is like the the what was the act called again? The UK Equality Act. The UK Equality Act. So you're looking for, for obviously equal treatment under there. But what do you have as a an asexual person or what, what specific rights do you not have as an asexual person? And I don't know UK law, I'll admit that. Um, but do you not have there that you that everybody else does have? Like, are there, is there something specific? Yeah, well, nowadays, if you were, for example, a gay man, people would not try and cure you for that. It is perfectly okay to try and cure asexual people and try to make them straight. That is still a perfectly legal thing, and it's part of our medical system right now, and that's impacting a lot of people. Similarly, if you had, if you were gay, for example, and you were to experience a hate crime, your sexual orientation is recognized as a sexual orientation, and you would be able to complain about that. Things would be done about that, hopefully. Um, but that's not the same for asexual people. If something happens and there really isn't a lot that we can do about it because so we aren't recognized under the Equality Act. And yes, Yasmin comes in here and totally knocks it out of the park right off the bat. And this is exactly what we're talking about. The issue is with government laws about discrimination, oftentimes ace people are not included. And it's not because the government is actively typically trying to discriminate against ace people in an active way. But we are so underrepresented that when it comes to definitions of sexual minority groups or what a sexual orientation is, East people are just not put on those definitions at all. They are not put on those lists. And so that means when there are laws that protect other groups, we're not part of those protections, which mean there are huge gaps where ace people can be discriminated against in terms of housing and employment and other areas. And that needs to be addressed because yeah, we do deserve that protection. And even on another level, right? We don't just have the legal issues as well. We have the medical issues too. And the medical issues that can run the gamut, right? You have people that go into doctor's offices and usually they will ask, especially depending on what you're going in for, they will ask about your sexual activity. And being ace can lead to all kinds of 
invasive questioning and interrogation and medical providers either not believing you or not knowing what to do with you. And that leads to unnecessary testing and procedures and just things we shouldn't have to deal with. And even on the more extreme end, yes, ACE people can be subject to conversion therapy. That is definitely a thing that happens. And even not just that, but oftentimes ACE people, even before they maybe realize they're ACE and that's like their identity, they will be misdiagnosed as a disorder. They will be told this is a medical problem that needs to be solved. Oftentimes this can be something like hypoactive sexual desire disorder or HSDD. And there's other ones as well, but that tends to be the big main one that people get misdiagnosed with because the distress that can come from being an ace person living in a non-ace world is misdiagnosed as being something that needs to be fixed and solved because it's causing the person distress. You know, there's a difference between that. And we don't have a ton of studies about this, but we do have some literature where we can tell that internally the experience of something like hypoactive sexual desire disorder is different from being asexual. And there is just not a lot of awareness about that. So Yasmin, and again, I appreciate you coming on to answer some of these questions, but you know, if you're if, if let's say me, I'm having a conversation with you, I convince you that, hey, I, you know, I think you should try, you know, having a companion or being romantic or, or spending time with someone. It, it would that was that just that's my opinion saying, hey, look, I'm married. Why? Why don't you try it? Would that be considered hate? I think the problem is when people make well-meaning comments like this, they're never actually that well-meaning. You know, sometimes you will get comments from close family and friends where they do legitimately just want you to have a happy life and because of how society is organized, it can be more difficult to truly have a respected happy life without certain things being a part of it. But I mean, look at the response that Yasmin's photo got. Was that well-meaning, oh, I just want you to be happy stuff? No, it wasn't. It was people criticizing her and questioning her and being very invasive and insistent that they knew her more than she knew herself. And that is not the same as just like, oh, well, I'm happy being married. Have you thought about being married? And trust me, most ace people have thought about this. We have sat and gone, okay, how do I want my life to be? Society is saying, I need to do X, Y, Z thing in order to be happy. We are inundated with messages and advertisements and books and everything that are filled with romance and sex being the number one things you can accomplish in life when that might not be true for every person, ace or not. And having that pressure can really warp your perspective and make you feel like you just don't fit when the reality is is that you do fit people just need to make room for different ways of having a happy life um no it would be a uh, something you're not really in the place to say but i wouldn't count that as hate um it would just be a strange comment i actually have a lot of companions so you don't need a sexual companion to have a companion <laughs> Okay, so you know there was you wrote this article that says, uh, "quote I'll never fall in love and that's okay." What it means to be a romantic? Don't you think you're missing out on a basic human connection here, though, to 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 certain extent? I have so many human connections. I have some incredibly deep long-term relationships. It doesn't have to be romantic to be okay. a deep long-term relationship. And Yasmin once again is absolutely right here. On the one hand, I do kind of see where people are coming from because society is getting lonelier. People have less friends. They have less fulfilling relationships. And the way that society is currently organized and the way that things are prioritized means that typically the one guaranteed source of emotional connection and fulfillment comes from a monogamous, usually heterosexual, marriage that is focused on romance and sex and having a family and having children, right? That's the ultimate end point of this, but also just like dating in general, having an exclusive partnership with one person that you pour all of your emotional bandwidth into and it's all about the sex and all about the romance and everything else is kind of like 
around the edges of that. You know, it's not as important. It can be okay. And so what happens is you have people that have like a very tiny, like one person inner circle, and then they have like a very wide gap between that and anyone else. And oftentimes it's seen as threatening to have close outside relationships or friendships with people of the same gender or the opposite gender, any gender at all, really. People can get jealous over literally nothing, but people just do not have the same level of connection that they used to. But the solution to that is not pressuring people into, again, that heterosexual, monogamous, long-term, romantic sexual connection. It's about expanding how it's okay to be intimate with people and forging those connections and encouraging those connections. Because right now, we basically tell people who don't get married or they don't want to get married that their life is meaningless. That there is no point in having friendships or connections unless it serves you to get to this other thing or if you have this other thing first which is just not always the case. Yes, people, you know, like me, we are hopeless romantics and we wanna have a lifetime partner or partners, but some people just don't want that. And it's okay, we should be encouraging everyone to be building more, happier, longer term connections, whether they be romantic or sexual in nature, but just emotionally close on any level. And the fact that we eternally pair emotional connection with exclusively sex and romance on the highest level. I just don't think that really serves anyone and it's ultimately not really that healthy. All right, and, and where did this asexual thing come from? Because I mean, like I, I know plenty of people that, you know, just don't have a female or male or opposite sex or whatever sex companion. Um, and, and that's okay, like I don't classify them as asexual. What makes someone who just doesn't do that to someone who actively chooses not to? Well, if you're choosing not to have sex, that could just be being celibate. That could be abstaining from sex. Asexuality is a type of sexual orientation. I was born asexual. I have stayed asexual. And that's just part of my makeup. And it isn't something new. Asexuality has been included within queer theory since the 1800s. It's just that people have only just started noticing. I get the feeling the subtext here is basically like, I mean... Why'd you have to come up with all these new fangled words? I mean, asexual? Why'd we have to have that one? That sounds like one of those dang neo-pronouns. I mean, dear gender, what's that about? And it's like, they are not the same thing, but even if they were, it wouldn't matter because none of that is any of your dang business, okay? And I am no expert at ace history, but I am pretty sure that we have been talking about asexual as a term since the 60s and 70s. It hasn't been as widely known as, you know, gay or lesbian or things like that, but it has been around. We have an asexual manifesto. It is a thing. It wasn't invented yesterday, okay? Okay, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually still, look, always great conversation, but I, I'm still struggling to understand how this is a thing. And I don't understand why it would be its own category if it's, if it's put part of, you know, a larger movement. Why does it have to be its own category? Why, why is it uh, that you are standing up specifically for these rights? Well, why wouldn't it be its own category? It's a type of sexual orientation. It's not just, oh, you're attracted to men, you're attracted to women, and that's it. There's more to it than that. But, we're equally as defined by what we're not attracted to as we are by what we are attracted to. And we, so it falls under the acronym. But arguably, it's the absence of a sexual orientation. So therefore, shouldn't it just be like with me? Like, I'm a norm, normal guy married to a woman. Like, is it, shouldn't it just fall under, like, any other category? What other category? Like, I mean, does it have to fall under the LGBTQ umbrella or can you just say, hey, look, I'm a citizen, I do my thing and that's that? I am a citizen and I do my thing and I have a sexual orientation and I'm not straight, therefore it falls under the umbrella. Hmm. Okay, well... There you have it, Yasmin Benoit, or Benoit, sorry, I appreciate you coming on. And I'll <laughs> admit I still am t not totally clear on what's going on, but you know what? We always appreciate the conversation. Very service guarantees citizenship energy happening over here, right? And it is very telling that he referred to himself as normal, as in anything else is not normal and weird or strange, or maybe even just straight out bad. 
And my rebuttal to this is always to say, you know, hey, you're saying, why do we need to make this distinction? Well, you know, zero is a number, right? We understand that nothing is worth distinguishing from having something, right? The absence of something is worth talking about and it is different than having something be present, right? Like I think even going back to like the early like Kinsey studies, right? We had people that were in X category where they had no reaction to either homo or heterosexual things happening. I don't really know a lot about how that was framed, but it's just like my very fuzzy memory about it. So we understand even from very early research about this that not having sexual attraction is definitely a thing that is worth making a distinction about. And we are not the same as straight people. I don't know how many times I'm gonna have to explain this one, but I'm not straight, okay? For other reasons too, but also because of the ace thing. And I do not have the same experience in life as a straight person. Internally, navigating the world, all of that, uh, I feel foreign to a lot of straight people. My brain does not make sense to them. I like my existence is definitely very different. And that by itself to me proves why we need to have a distinction and use this label and you not liking it or not being able to remember the word because it's too different or whatever. Like, I'm sorry, your dictionary in your brain doesn't have any more space left in it, but it is a word that is worth having. And that is basically the whole interview. And I hope that you all enjoyed this. This was kind of like a ride, but I really needed to talk about this one because it's been bothering me. It's been on my mind for like the last week and I wanted you all to know about it and hopefully learn some other stuff here as well. And if you have thoughts about this, I would love to know what they are. You can leave those in a comment down below, especially if you are also ace. Like, did you know about this? Did you see it happen? Did you participate? what did you think about all this happening? And if you're not ace, did you learn something? Let me know again in a comment down below. If you did enjoy this and you're not already, please do subscribe because I make videos twice a week about all sorts of kink, BDSM, polyamory, asexuality related topics. And finally, if you want to support what I do, the best way you can do that is with Patreon. A link to that will be down below. If you do already support me there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great yesterday and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.